my special guest today would have to be one of the best, if not the best, ocean racer out there. He has won multiple around the world ocean races, including skippering one to victory, has participated in multiple America's Cup campaigns in numerous roles. The list of amazing boats that he has sailed is just ridiculous. And he's the owner and CEO of Doyle Sales. Welcome, Mike Sanderson. Yeah, well, thanks, Steve, for the incredibly overflattering uh, intro. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, it's lovely to be here. Always a pleasure to talk to you guys, especially, you know, about the cool boats we're all involved with together. So, no, absolute pleasure. So a bit of a rundown of today's interview, and I tend to give this to every interview I do. Where uh, We're going to talk about the Cherub, which is uh, it's a boat that's close to your heart at the moment. Uh, we're going to talk about Doyle Sales, which you're a uh, very big presence in, being the CEO, uh, yep. the Ocean Race, and then Maxis, and then we'll have a bit of a conclusion. So straight into it, let's talk about the Cherub. With a resume <laughs> like yours, what could you possibly be bringing to the Cherub class? Well, the Cherubs, you know, it has been pretty much dead. Well, it has been dead in New Zealand, and, and you know, for for 15, almost 20 years, to be honest. Um, and, you know, originally a New Zealand class and then obviously, you know, grew to Australia and, and to the UK. And, um, you know, I was looking for a little high performance dinghy, um, which were single trapeze that I could go and have some fun sailing um, with my 10 year old boy. And. So I found this old boat on on you know Trade Me. It turns out that it's it was Andy Kensington who's one of the structural engineers at, at Team New Zealand, and um, it was his boat from from 19 yeah 1990 1989 1990, and um, yeah it was cheap. It was going to do you know it was going to be a great little experiment. And when I did it up uh, during our first lockdown here in Auckland, you know, I didn't ever expect to race against another cherub again. That wasn't what it was about. It was just about getting Merrick, my son, my eldest son, um, out dinghy sailing and something which we could rip around the harbour. And, you know, we kind of kept it under the radar, and but we'd started posting some pictures and videos of what we were doing. And I mean, to be honest, the response was overwhelming. I just, you know, suddenly it was like, boom, you know, New Zealand was reintroduced to the Cherub. And it turns out there were lots of other people in similar situations that I was where, you know, their kids weren't, you know, weren't enjoying or weren't continuing to go down what, you know, I would call a Grand Prix dinghy racing path. Um, which isn't for the faint-hearted, to be honest, you know. Um, and y y yeah, so listen, it's it's been a wonderful. It's it's been such a cool six months, and we are only just into it. Um, it's been all in the winter so far, so we haven't even endured a summer yet of of cherub sailing. Um, so yeah, it's really cool. Huge amount of interest. Um, and most recently, we've had um, Dan Leach who. Is a very well-known skiff designer here in New Zealand, uh, based in the South Island. Um, he's just done a very cool little F8 foiling um, kids version of a moth. I know um, it well. Yeah, exactly. He's coming out fitted with full Ronston gear, so I know yeah, it very it well. Yeah, he is, and Doyle Sales, so there you go. Oh, dang, partnershiping again. Exactly. So no, it's really cool. And so yeah, Dan's, you know, Dan does some amazing things, and he's he's done one of these. Um, plywood um, CNC cut kit set boats for us um, that'll be down to minimum weight very modern design um, you know you know it, it he he reignited the okay dinghy class here in New Zealand um, with his with his design boats and you know the his boats were first and third in the worlds that were here last year yep um, and so, yeah, it's we've, you know, straight away when we got this out on social media and stuff, we had, you know, over 30 expressions of interest of people that wanted to build them. Um, and we've 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 dug old cherubs out, literally dug old cherubs out. One one was a sand was was a sand pit at a Northland campground, um, <laughs> which we which we dug out, and the hull was still immaculate and. We ripped the decks off, or the or Alan Roper ripped the decks off, and we've um 
it's it's going to be you know um, back to her former glory, well better than her former glory. So now it's really cool what's happening. I love it. I just think it's fantastic. But why the cherub? Why what stood out about the cherub that made you go? That's the boat we're going to have a crack at. Well, I mean, I th- you know, the Cherub was initially created to be a home build. And so the design, you know, is very orientated. You know, it's a hard, uh, you know, hard chined, um, you know, now false floor, you know, light, short, high performance skiff. But it's 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 quite, um, you, you know, it's got it's got strict enough rules that that the boats are within a in a box. Um, it's a beautifully mannered little boat. Um, you know, s- certainly the older designs were designed for symmetrical spinnakers, and and they had these little tiny bubble spinnakers up very high, you know, on a high halyard hoist, you know, with poles way up in the air and these massive long spinnaker poles. And so the boats were inherently pro- probably pretty nosy. And now that we've put prods and genicas on them, or well, you know, you guys did in Australia, what would be now 20 years ago, I'm sure, um, put mm. prods and genicas on them. You know, they're just the most beautifully behaved little boat um, you know, from a skiff from a skiff standpoint, certainly. And um, it, you know, I just love it. I mean, it's perfect in New Zealand because you know Kiwis don't really like one design sailing <laughs> you know it's just not it's it's just in our nature as it is in Oz to to have a crack at modifying something <laughs> you know and and so you know anything which you can tinker with I think really suits um, our Anzac culture and so you know I mean and even more so if people can build them in their garage you know um, we're going to be able to build these plywood boats which are down to Class, you know, the Australian class minimum weight. Mm. And yeah, of course, you can build one which is better out of carbon and Nomex and, and all, the, all, the, all the fruit. But as people will quickly work out when they put their 10, 11, 12, 13 year old kid on the boat, if the goal is to keep them in sailing, well, the, the boats, the ultimate boat speed is the least of your problems. You know, you're, you know, if you don't get the jib out of the cleat going into attack, you're swimming. If you, if you, you know, don't look after them, you know, you'll send them around the head stay. If there's lots of, there's lots of other factors which make it really cool. And so, you know, whether you're going to build one of these new Dan Leach boats or a new Alan Roper boat, or whether you're going to build, uh, whether you're going to find a 1988 boat that was a sand, that there was a sand pit. Um, you you're still going to be very capable of of winning races in 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 what we set up because the reality is we're all going to be out there with our you know kids or or girlfriends or partners or you know husband or wife or whatever but all out there to try and you know just keep people and get people excited about sailing. Now if if a couple jump out of a 29er. To come and you know to come and do a regatta with us, that's fine. They can just sail off in the distance. We'll still have to look after our after our kids and make sure that um, you know there's hot chips or pies or ice creams and stuff at the end, and 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 we're all having a good time. So that really is the focus. And every any time someone says to me, "Oh yeah, but what about this? This will be fast," I've said, "Just take just take your kid for a sail, and you'll very quickly learn out learn that." 40 mils of mast height or, or, you know, what degree you're shooting the jib at. Doesn't you know, matter. Doesn't matter. If no. you get them to tack and jibe and hoist and drop and, and, and get the thing planing up wind and, and, you know, teach make them. Make it fun. Make it fun. And I mean, we have had some awesome sales and, and, you know, and anyone that, follows our Chair of New Zealand Facebook page and, and uh, you know, checks out my um, Facebook stuff. You know, we've we've had such a cool time. And him and I, you know, we're, we're, one of the beauties is, as you can see in that photo behind you, you know, with me hiking, although I get a lot of hard time from my mates that I'm actually terrible, that's the most pathetic hiking you'll ever see. <laughs> but with him, you know, with him wiring and me hiking, you know, our, our head, six eight hundred mils apart for, with our heads 
So yeah. we're chatting away. I would guess at best half the time about sailing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we chat away about, you know, what movies we like and we chat about what we have for dinner and whether it's time to stop and have a, have a you know, a lolly or... <laughs> and, um, but it's been amazing to watch because just even over time, you know, um, when I started, I, you know, I basically said to him, well, we won't, we won't race this boat, it'll just be fun. And then, then one of the last times we went to, he said to me, he said to me, dad, oh, you know, we're going to have to, we're going to have to race this thing, you know? And I said, yeah, yeah, but we'll just race somewhere fun and, and get an ice cream or something. He goes, oh no, I think we should, you know, we should do a proper starts and go around some marks. And so I was like. You know, that was, it was I, just about, work. I just about teared up, I'll be honest. You know, it was <laughs> like, you know, I had to, I had to hold back the excitement because it was like, okay, this could work. And, that, I mean, the photo behind me must have been a special day. That's a really, really cool shot. Yeah, it's really cool. And, and, you know, um, you know, uh, Merrick knows, um, well, Blair particularly well and, his godfather, Curly Soldhouse, drives the chase boat, and you know we hang out a lot with Glenn Ashby and Ray Davies and and the guys. So y- you know they they lined us up, which was fun. And um, it's a little bit disconcerting is wandering around the back of the mainsail, as you can see there, doing forty something knots towards us. But uh, I'm sure probably in bare feet too, as he yeah, normally sails. I'm sure uh, Lenny was probably in control at that stage, which is you know having um done a lot of cruising with Glenn and he likes to uh he likes to hang it out a bit and, and with with adventurous stuff so um yeah it was it was it was really cool it was really special and they they, they were just flying when they came past us so that, that's fun. so so cool so yeah. what's what's your plans with the future of the class because I know you've had some pretty cool sailors on uh, the Doyle sails Ronston boat. You've had uh, Ray yep. Davies and one of his sons on there, yeah, and yeah, I know you're yep. talking about getting exactly. Glennie and the girls on there. Yeah, exactly. No, I mean we we did the boat and collaborate a, a second boat, and and you know which you guys helped us with, which was amazing. And and yeah, we've had Ray Davies, and we've you know we've had um, uh, Scott Beavis, and and we've had you know some really cool um, people take it for a sail, you know. Um, some really you know well-known kiwi sailors and things and but you know we've had interest from all sorts of pros um you know all, all so many of old mates of mine and i wonder if a little bit of that is because you know lots of us would have loved our kids to follow in our footsteps and we're you know we might have pushed them out there a bit early and so i think it's not uncommon you know, for um, people in the industry to have been a bit over enthusiastic with their kids, mm. um, and so this this could be you know a great chance for them to get back into into uh, you know get them excited about about our, our great sport. You know, so yeah, a huge amount of interest. Um, you know, I think we we do have to be you know a little bit um, you know they are they are a high performance dinghy. And, you know, I mean, Merrick and I have done 19 and a half knots in the thing. And which I originally didn't believe, but then it was suddenly I had it on my watch and on the speed puck in the boat. So I, I had to believe it. Um, you know, we and and uh, but, you know, we've, we've we've you know, I'm very careful of, of looking after him. You know, that's the only important thing. Um, you know, we've only had, we've probably sailed the boat 30 times now and only swum once, touch wood. Um, and that was just, we we were sailing in a very puffy, windy day and it got squally and he couldn't get the jib out of the cleat and I couldn't get the bow up. It was just one of those ones where we just did this very pathetic, um, <laughs> rolled it over, you know. But, um, and we're very careful, you know, we, he knows that when we capsize it, that He's going to stay on the uh, inside, you know, he's going to just roll back in the boat when I write it. And um, so, you know, we, we've got some good little techniques in place. But no, he's, you know, he's a very competent, you know, he's got really handy at, at his trapezing and stuff. And um, I mean, let's be honest, no one likes bailing and no one particularly likes hiking. So mm-hmm. if suddenly you're an 11 year old kid or 12 or 10 or whatever, 
you know, to be able to get rep around doing 19 knots, you know, in, yeah. a, trapeze, in a trapeze harness, um, you know, with your mum or dad or uncle or aunt or, or whoever, mm. and, um, you know, playing upwind and rip off, rip off downwind and put shoots up. It's just, just really cool. So yeah, it's got every, it's got everything the chair. You're going to learn all aspects of sailing. It's fantastic, and as you said, the Olympic route's not for everyone. It's yeah, and I, you know, I think you got to be, you know, you got to be a little bit careful too, because just because, you know, you're 12 and you're sailing a chair with your old man doesn't, you know, yes, you're not going to go to the well, unlikely, but, you know, you look at someone like, um, well, you know. Um, I'm uh, just trying to think who, um, yeah, like there's 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 plenty of examples um, of people who are, came from serious boating families, and um, you know they end up either cruising through the islands or or whatever, and they end up crewing in a 49er or a 49er FX, and you know, I mean, who knows where one of these one of these kids will end up being. Let take take Glen Ashby. Let, Let, Glen Ashby started on a paper tiger. Exactly. And then went on to an A class and then yep. went to the Olympics on a tornado and now he's yeah, skipper exactly. of an America's Cup boat. So. Exactly. And I mean, to be honest, with, with my sailing, I didn't hit my, you know, didn't hit my straps until I was in my teens. And, you know, and I, and I came through our classes in 12 foot skiffs and bits and pieces. But, um, yeah, of course, I mucked around in opties and peas and things like everyone does in New Zealand, but I was a no, I certainly, you know, at that stage wasn't lining up to be a professional sailor, you know. So, yeah. um, you know, I think I think we've got to be careful that there that there is definitely more than one road um, definitely. To, to, to sailing success in our sport, luckily still. That's right, definitely. Yeah. Hey, well, look, we'll jump into Doyle Sales now. So you're yep. the CEO and the co-owner of Doyle Sales. Tell me what the role of the CEO of Doyle Sales entails. The role of the CEO of Doyle Sales is to employ the best people you can to do all the hard work. That's, <laughs> that's, my, that's my job and very, very... A delegator. Happy. Yeah, <laughs> chief delegator. There's no doubt about it. And... Um, you know, we I've never hidden from that from that as a philosophy. It's what it's what we it's what I did when we were lucky enough to win the Volvo Ocean Race. Um, you know, I've always been a great believer in the sport of sailing that there hasn't really ever been a massive upset when you go, you know, caliber of person to caliber of person across the across the across the teams. Um, that you, you know, you see uh, why these things end up being successful, and I see, you know, what my approach with Doyle Sales has been no different. I just wanted to get the best people, uh, create the best team, and those people would would you know make the fastest sales and the and the most and would be good at creating a, the best sailing environment for people. You know, I've, so I've been I've been lucky enough to do a visit to your amazing loft over there in New Zealand. And yep. to say amazing is probably not a big enough word. Like it is a huge uh, footprint that yeah. you've got there and the, and where you make the the films out the back. It's, yeah. Yeah, I mean, give, give us a bit of a rundown what the factory entails over there. Yeah. Well, you know, the Stratus plant, which is our membrane technology, um, you know, it's capable of building over 3000 square meters of custom membrane a week. And, um, you know, the, the facility in, in Auckland um, supplies all the Doyle um, lofts around the world um, with these custom membranes. And, and the lofts can either receive them as the separate sections or in one piece or as a finished sale, depending on what, uh, how the local loft owner and operator wants to, wants to do it. And so, you know, we're set up for that in New Zealand. Um, unfortunately, we, you know, we went through a 60%, 60%, 70% uh, increase in capacity, a big build um, starting off in March last year, and that opened in March 1 this year. Um, so our timing wasn't great um, with COVID and, and lockdowns, et cetera. 
but you know the 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 world of sailing is going to come back you know no doubt whatsoever and we've been incredibly fortunate that that we're probably more involved in either the you know the local area club sailing and then at the super yacht and grand prix end and both of those have been the first to 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 kick back off um as as the world gets used to dealing with COVID. um and so we're very we're really fortunate with our client base we didn't have one cancellation um due to COVID, which is just remarkable and really shows the um the incredibly fortunate position we're at with the with the, our client base you know um so yeah big operation lots of wonderful people involved in it um you know we're we're definitely um you, you know we're doing some really cool things um with all our lofts around the world um and this cableless and structured loft um revolution for us has been huge um you know we 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 pioneered it we kicked it off we led the charge um our biggest competitors you, you know started off for the first 18 months saying it doesn't work and so that you know that really worked in our favor and you know as they got on board with it they were you know behind and and we've managed to just keep that nice buffer of of being in front and that technology um and that's and that's gone well for us and um you know we'll, we're, we're keeping pushing hard on that and it's 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 really cool it's you know it's the first thing in in the aero world and in maybe in yachting in general that in the big picture will bring the price of you know boats down um you know um the loads are down the rig weights are down once you get the loads and the rig weights down the boats are lighter well um, yep. lighter boats need smaller equipment need less fuel need smaller engines it's just the trickle down is all the way through the boat mm. and so that's a very cool thing that you know that um um you know we've, we've, we've come up with something so significant that is going to affect naval architecture going forward i um one of the facts that i got told when i was uh doing the tour there is your original uh laminating table where you make the the um the yeah. sails there is uh was based around Kokomo's uh, foot length of its jib. Like he didn't yeah, want to exactly. seam up the up the middle yep. of the jib. So yep. this is an enormous table. Like it goes the yep. whole span of the room. It's yeah, 50, 50 <laughs> meters. Uh, the, yeah, the yeah the original. I think the original Kokomo Reacher was forty six or forty seven meters on the foot. Mm. And um and but and now the new table is sixty eight meters. Um, oh wow! So. So basically, our limitation now is, um, you know, is is something which is potentially 65, 67 meters on the foot. That's so, a big sail. It's a big sail, and of course, unlimited from a height standpoint. So, I mean, we've got some very exciting projects which we're, you know, deep into the engineering of. I mean, you know the. The wealthy are getting wealthier, and and their enthusiasm for more exciting and and pushing the boat out literally is 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 getting cool. So there's some amazing, you know, 70, 80, 90, 100 meter projects out there in the world of of people, you know, really. Um, so it's it's very cool to see. You know, when we when we designed Marisha Four back in 2000, you know, we made her a, a schooner equal height rigs because we we felt that was the biggest um, 3DL sail um, that we that we could have had then, and uh, you know that was against you know North wouldn't wouldn't warrant it. It was you know we'd really been aggressive, you know. Mm. Um, and those sales are tiny now in comparison to to what we what what the world is building. So, yeah, it's changing pretty quickly. I, I mean, it must uh, bigger sales means heavier sales. I mean, the more the size they're going to be in terms of moving them around. Geez, that must be hard. And yeah. get cranes in to get them out. Yeah, yeah, quite literally, you know. And um, one of the beauties with our process is is we're able to um, put the sales into one piece. 
and 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 spread them as we call them in sail making and and you, you know and then we're actually able to pull them back apart and build them in sections and then they only go uh, back together in one piece in the very final in the very final phase and um, that that means that yeah to date most things have been very manageable but there is there's no doubt you know we're working on projects which um which will you know just have to further evolve you know we're certainly getting to the stage where 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 the the sales stay still and the and the machines are working around them. <laughs> oh, very good. So uh, my next question is: uh, Doyle Sales is involved in some of the most amazing boats in the world, from super yachts uh, to full-blooded race boats like uh, the Amokas. Yeah. What goes into designing a sail plan for something like Hugo Boss, which you guys are heavily yeah. involved in? Yeah. So, uh, it's, you know, even um, you know, I've been sail making now for yeah thirty years. I've been in the game. And, um, you know, slowly over time, the sail makers have become more and more involved and more involved in the design team. Now we're basically an integral part um, of the, uh, you know, of the design phase right from the boat's inception, if it's pushing the boundaries out in any shape or form. Because the reality is the design um you know is only as good as the aero model which is feeding the vpp which is driving the whole the whole mm -hmm. design process so if the aero model is um is wrong then and the concepts are wrong which go into the aero model um then then the whole thing doesn't work now especially when you start talking about boats flying like in the background or even planing like the one in the foreground you know but because if you take the aero model and then you take the weight and then you say okay well then the loads are driving the weight and the weight and the loads are driving the aero model you know that the, what we're doing with the sail making aspect of it and structured luff and aero you know that as i said the aero tool you know, it's a really big part of it. Um, so gone of the days where someone's designed a boat, is building a boat, has got the rig, and they come and ask us to quote a set of sales. Anyone that does that now has missed out a huge amount of of potential refinement, you know? Wow. Yeah. Okay. And and one thing which we do, you know, I, I sort of refuse to um, uh, charge people the design fee on top of their sale price. So if we're doing an extensive amount of design work, what we'll do, you know, if they haven't even decided to do the project to say, hey, well, you give us a, a, a deposit um, for your sales and and we'll do all the design work we'll feed the vpp we'll, we'll work with the designer we'll be a, we'll be part of this team which at times is up to 18 months or two years and then when you come to buy the sales that that contribution which you've made uh, even though we've spent all the time on design <laughs> will will actually go in and as a deposit um for your sales so it's a it's a way of helping these projects um evolve and and be as good as they can be yeah, I mean, it's uh, leads into my next question. Like where sail making was even 20 years ago, where we were yeah. still playing around with dacrons and that. Uh, what it is now is ridiculous. Um, yeah. Do you see what's the next step in sail making? Are we going to be seeing twin skin sails, deck sweepers, like we're seeing in the background behind me? Yeah. yeah. Well, we're only just touching the surface with the structured luff technology, and um, you know, there's you, you know, you don't have to look very hard to see that. You know, some of the America's Cup teams have taken it even into mainsail world. You know, and so um, you, you know that if you combine that um, with with foil assist, whether you you know whether your the boat's coming all the way out of the water like behind, or whether it's some form of DSS or a combination of 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 it, you know, a mocker meets. A mocker meets AC75 meets, you know, a DSS board on a on a 150 foot cruising super yacht. I mean, um, 
you know, we, uh, sail making is is keeping up quickly, and um, you know, we we're adapting, and um, you know, I think there's some cool stuff going on um, in in the sailing world at the moment. You know, I I, I you know I, I think of it a bit like, you, you know, if you sales were probably a little bit stalled for a while you yeah. know and if you think how quickly windsurfer sales evolved and how quickly kite you know the kite technology involved evolved it was at a rapid pace and you know sales you know definitely got a bit stagnant um but there's nothing like a cup cycle or or you know a more open ocean race rule um, bit of maxi boat sailing, bit of you know F50s and sail GP, soup even super foiler and things like that to to really um, put some pressure to come up with some cool stuff. I yeah. mean even even you know Kyle and TJ ripping around you know in in the moth development that the guys did before the last worlds. Um, uh, you know, with us was re was really fun, and they and they really pushed us hard to make sure that we came up with something new. You know, and you've just launched a new moth sale, I see. Yeah, yeah, which is which is really cool. Yeah. Um, and, and evolution again. We're still, you know, Kyle's um been driving that, and um and you know he's been he's spent a lot of hours testing it uh, up in the northern hemisphere, and yeah, we're you know we're really excited about it. Yeah, it looks great. It looks great. We'll jump yeah. into the ocean race now. So probably the one you're most famous for is the 2005-2006 where you won the Volfo Ocean Race as the skipper of ABM AMRO 1, the black yep. boat. <laughs> um, I think one of the most fascinating things about that uh, era was it was a first generation of the Volvo 70s. So you were taking basically a virtually untested concept, full noise around the world, What's that like? Yeah, um, it was it was very cool. It was an amazing project to be a part of, and you know, I I was a you know I was a cog and a and a big wheel there with the ABN project. Um, so you know what really shaped that program a lot. There were a couple, you know, key parts of it. Obviously, you know, it was it was probably that you know the introduction of Juan K to the world. You know, Juan Kamajan had been, you know, he'd been involved. He had Crazy Coyote at the 99 Admirals Cup, which was very controversial. And, you know, he'd been involved in some uh, America's Cup teams and, he'd, you know, he'd worked, um, you, you know, uh, he, he, was a, he was a product of the Southampton University Naval Architecture School, etc. You know, very talented guy. But, you know, Roy Heiner gave him a chance with ABN AMRO project, which, you know, many thought was pushing the boat pretty left field. And um, I never forget when Paul Kayard came up to me, who I'd done a lot of sailing with at Oracle and things, um, after we launched the white boat. And um, and he said, well, I'm sure, you know, most as sensible as you are, that your second boat will be quite a lot more conservative. And I'm like, mm, hmm. yeah, you might just have, yeah, you have to wait and see, you know. But no, that was a very cool thing. And, you know, we had an amazing crew. It was, you know, and it was a great team. And, you know, that it's fantastic. It was fantastic working for the Dutch. You know, they, they're a very, you know, they're a nation of very straight talkers. Um, you know exactly where you where you stand. Um, they were very clear um, about, about what the goal was. And I mean, our team, you know, our team slogan was one clear goal. <laughs> So it was, you know, we were there for a purpose. Um, they gave us no excuses that, you know, they there was no pressure to take anything or do anything. Um, it was a, it was a wonderful time in my career, that's for sure. Um, you know, the you know the ability to sail with, you know, Stan Honey and Brad Jackson and Rob Greenhouse and you know Mark Christensen and you know we had an amazing amazing team there. Um, and again, back to my, has there ever been any surprises? Well, you know, the reality is we had more helmsmen than anyone else. We'd spent more time on the water than anyone else. We had a good budget. We'd done the most sail development. Um, you know, it, it was it was it was a wonderful team to be a part of. 
it, it's it's amazing because the Volvo 70s are still out there and they're still winning races. Like yeah. uh, I think it's now Wizard that was Giacomo before that, yeah. and then you know Blackjack was fully uh, fully yeah. optimized to have all the winches. But as I said, you were on the first generation of those Volvo 70s. A few sank in the race that we, <laughs> we lost a few. So yeah. it must be nerve wracking taking that that first generation of boats around the world at and into yeah. the Southern Ocean and. Yeah, less so for us. We were very fortunate enough to, you know, how I got introduced to that particular team is, um, as I was I was actually getting ready for the 2004 um, uh, Transat race, single-handed from, from Plymouth to Boston. Yep. And yeah, my wife, Emma, who is Emma Richards, who, um, from Around Alone fame, she, um, her and I had started the Transat Jacques Vab, but we broke the boat pretty badly on the, on the second night and um so we put it in the shed for uh, the kiwi summer and came home and she the next race on the calendar was the 04 transat and and she wasn't really that excited about doing it um you know quite a quite a bit bigger more powerful boat um than the one she went around alone in um and well not not bigger but more you know bigger sails and heavier sails mm. etc so she wasn't that keen on it single-handed so i put my hand up to have a crack and um you know i i yeah i had obviously you know i'd already done a couple of laps around the world by then and um but i hadn't done any single-handed sailing and you know dave endine brad jackson and emma and i basically we you know with a a bunch of guys you know troy tyndall uh matt smeaton you know and um you know, we were based in Gosport and and we basically they you know Emma gave me a crash course in learning to sail single handed and and I had a crack at the Transat which I ended up coming third in which I'm very proud of in a Vonda year. Um, so we were really fortunate that um, we'd spent this time in the Open Sixty. Um, you know we'd got very comfortable with twin rudder boats we'd you know we got comfortable with lazy jacks we'd got comfortable with you know code zeros and and you know um tight luft a3s and and so we you know we took all that open 60 experience straight to abn namro campaign so so we were taking a 70 foot open 60 around the world and the other teams that we were racing with were taking a turboed Volvo 60. Yeah. So we really approached it to total. Even though you know Brad and Dave and I had all come from a Volvo 60 past, we'd been converted to this open 60, um, you know, mentality and and type of sailing. And so we were, you know, you know, AB and Amro, you know, had no hydraulics. It had you know, it had lazy jacks, which was unheard of in, in ocean in Volvo Ocean Race World. It had a furling solent, which no one had ever done before in an ocean race. It had lots of short-handed um, features, which we'd picked up off the Open 60. And you know that that AB and Amro campaign that ended up shaping the way Volvo 70s went for their yeah. whole duration. And um, you know, you only got to look at a you know, even the Comanche and and things that they're, they're really just an evolution of of the Volvo 70, you know, to a certain extent, you know, yeah. Volvo 70 meets a Mocha 60. And um, and yeah, so it's it, it was a very cool time to be, um, you know, to be breaking into that new new ground. So, look, um, you've done a few ocean uh, Volvo or ocean races, as they're called now. Yeah. Do you, do you look back at any moments that stand out as a highlight or anyone that, because everyone thinks about the Southern Ocean it being terrifying of mountainous waves and big wind. Does any moment stand out of your head and go, cool, that day was one that I'll never forget? Yeah, and it's, it's, a, it's a, it, there, there is, and it's a bit, you know, it's, it's obviously a, it's a, it's a, it's quite a sort of deep one, but obviously, you know, when, we were very unfortunate to to lose Hans Horrifitz on the on the leg from New York um, to to um, Plymouth to, to sorry Portsmouth um, on the ABN Emro two on the kids boat 
and um you know so here i was you know basically running the sailing team for ab and emro it had been my literally my childhood dream you know to win the volvo ocean race as a skipper um you know we arrived into the uk um and secured the race win but you know our our second boat um had hans on board it also had the whole crew of Movistar on board who had sunk mm. um and you know it was just an incredibly emotional time i actually turned i had my 35th birthday during that stopover emma and i got married um you know we got up we during that stopover so we went ahead with the with with our wedding at, at the royal yacht squadron um, we got up at six o'clock in the morning on a charter flight to Hans's funeral in Holland. Um, and the next day we went out, as I said, on my 35th birthday and won the import race off Portsmouth. So, you know, that that 10 days from, you, you know, will, will, will I, I will remember every day of that 10 day period for the rest of my life. That's for sure. You know, it was it was unbelievable. And um you know some amazing obviously highs and some amazing lows and some you know just just the array of emotions is just unbelievable you know and wow. um, yeah very very amazing time that's uh it's a good answer yeah <laughs> the yeah, a bit, uh, different, bit different to the big wave that you were probably expecting yeah. but it's uh you know it really is a very special time and the and the you know the the sailing world will never you know forget the the people's lives who've been lost in the ocean race etc and um yeah yeah, yeah very it's, a, it's an it's an amazing feat just getting around the world doesn't matter where you come i think uh, what you guys do is just brilliant um the next race it looks a bit different we've got some two forms of boats going to go around the world we've got the volvo 65s are going to do it again and yep. they're introducing the amokas what, what are your thoughts on the next race yeah, I mean, obviously, that's been very unfortunate with the timing. Both, you know, the 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 um, sponsorship world is a was a bit is, was a bit tough, and then obviously the world entered into a into the into this global pandemic. And um, but you know, the the race has a huge amount of history, and y you know, anyone that that's interested in sailing knows about the Whitbread turn come Volvo Ocean Race come Ocean Race. So, you know, it's, I think every ocean race that's been in the last four cycles, you know, we've been worried about entries and, and here we are again, you know, worried about entries. But, uh, you know, I've got no doubt that the, the, the guys will do a great job and, and teams will come forward. Um, yeah, so, no, I mean, it's, I think it's, it's a fantastic thing to have a development class back in the race. I think the Volvo 65 did did an amazing job, and 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 we all, you know, in the 11, 12 race, we all agreed it was vital going forward that for a couple of versions there was this one design um, platform that would be used. Mm. Um, and you know, the last race in particular, I thought was was epic, you know, and just the ability to 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 draw a wide range you know, of sailors in our sport, you know, um, from the legends of, you know, Bow Becking through to Pete Burling and Blair Tuke and, you, you know, Kyle Langford and and then, you know, um, Chris Nicholson and, you know, just an amazing group of sailors. And and obviously the introduction or the second time of, of you know, the mixed, the, you know, the, the, the girls on the boats and, the, and just the even watching the evolution of how experienced and how big a, how, you know, how the great job that, that those teams all did, um, you know, of, of making, you know, that, that be as good as it was, um, was very cool. And, um, yeah, so, I mean, I think, yeah, let's see what the world lets us do a little bit from a health standpoint. Um, that's obviously, you know, the big, unknown at the moment um you know when will when we'll be allowed to travel freely um, yeah, exactly i'm sitting here in quarantine at the moment just uh one week still to go so um yeah it's going to be a it's 
it's going to be tough to 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 spend too much time on planes until borders start opening up a bit more freely. Yeah, completely agree. So um, we've just seen that the eleventh hour race team have designed in a mocker purely yep. around the race, um, and we've got the Vendee Globe about to start in about yep. a month's time. Yeah. Um, will we see some boats from the Vendee Globe transition over into the ocean race? I think for sure, you know, this, the, we we have to, and and you know, with the Vendée, they they that's their primary focus at the moment, and then as soon as that's done, which you know, with the speed these things go around the world now, that's you know, it's a pretty quick window, um, and then as soon as that's done, you'll see sponsors, depending on you know whether they achieved their goal or whether they just, um, you, you know, I think everyone will reassess at the end of the Vendée. And yeah. for lots of them, the ocean race, you know, is the next um, hopefully obvious choice. One of the downsides with the uh, Amoka fleet, and they've been working hard for years to try and change it, it's, it's very um, French, local sponsor orientated. Yeah. So, you know, from probably 75% of the sponsors, there's no value in going on an international race. Um and so it'll it'll just be the more international orientated sponsors and teams which um, will will look will look to the ocean race. So fingers crossed, you know, we have a great Vendée, and then and then those teams are excited to to join the ocean race. Because the mockers are built for one, maybe two people max, but five on board might be a little bit tough, I reckon. Yeah, it will be tough, but you know, I think you'll be. I think it'll be more. The alterations will be more about. Um, probably having to transition in and out of more stopovers. Yeah. Um, you know, the Vendée Globe is is the most downwind orientated race track that you can sail mm. um, for that length of time. Mm. Um, and and as soon as you bring having to come in and out of, of stopovers <clears throat> and obviously going up to Asia, et cetera, then you bring, you know, you bring quite a different wind matrix into the into the design equation. So yeah, the the boat will fundamentally still be right. The rig is one design, etc. So you you're really just talking about foil development and cockpit ergonomics and things. Yeah. Five in saying that, of course, is only two people on deck and you know someone navigating and two people in their bunks. So, um, you know, the reality is sailing two up on a 60 footer is the coolest, you know, some of the coolest yachting you'll do. Solo, it often feels like you can't quite do everything as well as you would like. Yeah. But two handed, you know, if you've got two on deck of an Amoka 60, you're sailing at it basically 100 percent. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, it will be amazing. To it, w- it would be a very cool thing to be a part of. Especially now, so you can slide the roof back and basically in your jammies and uh, sending it around the world, you know. Any, any chance we're seeing uh, Mike Sanderson step on board for one of these <laughs> things to go around the world again? Oh, you know, never say never. But, <laughs> um, but you know, the reality is, uh, you know, I'm loving the challenge I've got. You know, the, the thing I love the most about the, the Bob Ocean Race and the Whitbread and the Ocean Race in the past was was the challenge and the people and the team dynamic and making the boats go fast. Well, I, I live that all day, every day now. And, um, you know, all those aspects which I enjoyed, I've, I've got in spades. <laughs> so um, so I'm not in any rush. And, you know, I was pr- pretty not to, not to um, beat the cherub's drum too heavily. But, you know, Merrick and I were ripping down wind the other day We've got the 49ers off on our starboard side. We've got cup boat off to the left, and he said, he, and uh, you know, he, he we just had some pictures come through of Comanche from the Hobart race, which he'd seen, and and he said, oh, you know, Dad, what's your what's the what's your favourite boat? He goes, you've sailed some pretty cool boats, and um, and I said, honestly, this one, you know, to get to to get to to do this with you, for us to be having this conversation, to see the grin on your face, mm. for us to be eating pies and coke and and the thing on the ramp and our skiffing wetsuits doesn't get any better than that, you know. Okay. So um, it's 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 very cool. Um, 
and yeah, very lucky. Well, you, you, you've led me into my next question of the coolest boats because you've got quite the maxi boat sort of history. So I'm going to run through a list of boats here and I'll just get, get you to give me a bit of a brief summary on, on each of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, New Zealand Endeavour, which was Grant Dalton's Whip Red Catch. Yep. It was a pretty amazing boat you went around the world in. Yeah, amazing boat. I mean, that was, you know, that was a dream opportunity. I was 21 years old when I was given the opportunity to go on Endeavour, which is unheard of now. Um, you know, I ended up being, you, you know, I, I was on there as a helmsman and a trimmer and, and um, yeah, I got to sail with all the legends which I'd watched off Steinlager 2 and, and, you know, in the Fremantle America's Cup. And, you know, suddenly I was sailing with Grant Dalton and Mike Quilter and Kevin Shoebridge and Tony Ray and Glenn Sowery and all these guys who, who, I'd you know, were, were, were um, you know, had been, had, had had and were my heroes, you know, through the last last whip bread. I never thought I was going to get to do that whip bread. Um, I thought it would be the one after, um, yep. which would get which would be my first. And um, yeah, I was very very fortunate to get that opportunity. And then uh, I'll jump into probably one of my favourite boats of all time, being uh, Cyan- Cyan- Cyanara, yeah. which was uh, Larry Allison's seventy nine foot far. Back in the day, we thought that was a big boat, and that boat dominated sailing in the late nineties. Yeah, it, it it was pretty special boat, and um, yeah, I I was, uh, you know, involved in it in the in the latter part of its its career, and by the time I was involved, it was it was already dominating the world. So yeah, very lucky to to have had a good stint on. Yeah, very cool boat. Um, that obviously ended up getting me involved in the two thousand America's Cup with Larry, 2003 America's Cup with, with Oracle and, um, but no, Sayonara was very cool. It's, it's, it's funny though, as you say, you know, I look back at pictures of it now and it seems tiny, whereas in the day we thought it was just a monster. Yeah, I, I said to you prior to this interview, I saw it in the shed in uh, in San Francisco, just sitting there in uh, yeah. Oracle's base and you just think, well, it's like a hidden treasure that you haven't seen for so many yeah, years. Yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, Murray Shah three, 47 metre catch. Yeah, Murray Shah three is very, very dear to my heart. It was, it was, you know, 26 years old and I was basically throwing the keys, you know, to, to, to racing that boat. Um, beautiful big carbon fibre catch. Um, we were the first, you, you know, we, we created a bit of an upset by being first to finish the 99 um, Sydney Hobart race and, and, and broke the record, which upset the CYC immensely. Um, they, this, they, it was then decided we wouldn't get, hold the record, but, uh, but World Sailing, um, the World Speed Sailing Association uh, begged to differ, of which I had got many, many years of enjoyment um, uh, poking fun at Rico. Um, when I was sailing on wild oats, et cetera, to um, remind him that his record was actually beaten by a cruising boat, you know. And um, it wasn't until I think 2016 or 15 or 16 that they ended up actually beating our our um, Marisha three time to Hobart. So I got lots of fun out of that. I remember that Marisha three. You had your own start line and everything for that race. Yeah, we did. Yeah, it was yeah. It, it was um, yeah, it was interesting. Obviously, they never expected a you know, the, the, the whole idea was a super yacht division, which would drag super yachts to Australia on their way to the and America. Yeah, very cool concept. Yeah. And they obviously gave us a start and a finish and uh, but never thought that a super yacht was going to, um, you know, never the original intention was that a super yacht would uh, would would break the record. So, yeah, it was a small, uh, a small um whoopsie that's for sure and then it, that led into mari shaft four which a little bit smaller 42 meter catch yeah so mari shaft four was a very cool project basically straight after the 03 america's cup um we put a team together um which i was part of and um of clay oliver greg elliott philippe briand Jeff Tativo, the project manager, and myself, and we we basically, you know, the Miller family and Robert Miller gave us the brief of the primary focus was just to to 
to try and smash the um, the transatlantic record. We had broken the transatlantic record in 99 on Marisha 3, and 98, and but but in 2000, in the Mocha 60, and Miller was very keen to to get it back. So we built Marisha 4 with the sole purpose of of breaking the transatlantic record, and, and it was a you know a very cool boat. It was very purposeful. You know, we certainly could build a faster boat to go, you know, around a race track, but across the ocean, she was very hard to beat, you know, just would would just sit at, you know, high in, in the high 20s sustained for, for hours on end. Um, nothing quite like waterline length and light displacement to, to do that. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, the... Um, the the rigs were as big as we were comfortable we could build grand prix sales at the time yeah right well and so and most recently you've uh, been a key member on board the team of comanche uh winning two of the most prestigious ocean races in the world in the last 12 months the Sydney to hobart and the Transpac. uh what's it like i mean that yeah. is that is the fastest monohull on earth, the displacement <laughs> monohull on earth. I mean, the one behind us might be have something yeah, to say yeah. about that, but uh, it's an awesome boat. It is an awesome boat. It's it's a you know it's 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 a very impressive machine. You know, um, it's beautifully built um, and engineered. You know, the thing is a piece of furniture. It's full credit to um, you know the the team that built it um who are very similar team that built many of the players that are involved in american magic um is built so you know it's an amazing it's an amazing piece of of engineering of the it's a one again. video it's a one video design too isn't it yeah it's a co- collaboration again um vplp and and verdier and so it's it's as per that whole generation of of a mocker boats of that time they've now gone their separate ways in a mocha world but it was a collaboration between the two and um but it's been very cool you know while it was in australia um john hildebrand converted it to um with the cooney family and you know converted it to powered winches um which enabled us to sail the boat significantly lighter um mm. than we then had been able to sail before just from a, a people and hardware you know just the total sailing weight and um yeah so i mean that that definitely yeah it, of course it it's pretty parked and under eight knots of breeze but you know in seven eight it comes alive and then you know she just gets better and better as it gets windier till about 30 and then it starts getting a bit angry again oh okay well uh, that was my next question i was going to ask i mean yourself and doyle sales uh seem to help significantly in its light air performance because that's Achilles here was it was quite sticky in that light stuff, but the last Hobart, I mean, wasn't a windy Hobart, that's for sure. And you still got there across the line against some boats that probably should have beat you. Yeah, you know, we we obviously we we worked hard on that um, last year, but they worked particularly hard on that the year before. Again, when um, you know a different group of people were involved, but but we Doyle Sales were involved, and yeah, we you know we came up with a cool. You, you knew, you know, we ran all cableless, um, you know, uh, J0 and A3, A2s and A3s and stuff. And, um, you know, that definitely made a nice, nice jump. Um, and you, you know, so, um, yeah, just getting the weight out of the boat was a big thing. Um, yeah, the, the biggest driver was getting the, the total sailing weight down. So getting the, 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 the sail weight down, obviously getting rid of the cable weights is big on a boat like that. Um, and then getting the hydraulic system, which were in fact ended up being lighter than the manual system, but then also the people required to, yeah. to operate it. So, you know, these boats, as we were saying before, are super weight sensitive and... Um, you know, it, it might not seem like a big deal, but, you know, every, you know, you, you know, uh, you can notice 100 kilos on or off Comanche. And, um, you know, so you've just got to do everything you can to, um, you know, you know, to make them as light and especially for the light airs. It, it, it just looks to me like one of those boats. I know no boat sails themselves and are 
easy end, a hundred footer by no means is an easy boat to sub. It just looks like one of those boats you just get on and almost does it for you. Yeah, it's 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 not. It's always been very well sailed, and I, you know, I um, can, you know, it, it it's always had good people involved in it com- with Comanche. Uh, like the boat behind you, and obviously not to the same degree, but um, as boats are going faster and faster, you know, they are definitely requiring more and more accuracy. And and so, yes, it is capable of going fast, but it's it's also quite hard to make it, you, you know, go that last 7, 8, 10%, which is the difference between, you know, winning and losing, as we all know. Um, the other thing which is tricky with Comanche is it's it's very easy t- to to have significant downtime, <laughs> um, and so it's you, you know you one thing which we spent a lot of time working on pre this Hobart um, was making sure you know if even through a sail change, you know if we could do 17 or 18 knots through the change instead of 12. Um, well, then that, you know, that was that, you know, sometimes the change might take 20 minutes. That's a significant difference. Yeah. If you, if you did 25 and you buried it through a wave, you might flush the sail and and hurt people. So it was a it was we just spent a lot of time working on what that balance was to make sure that we would we it, it whatever we were doing, we were gain we were getting to Hobart as quickly as possible. And <laughs> How does it go people power wise? It sounds like, I mean, moving, just moving sails requires people power on that sort of boat. So it, it must be a tiring boat. Yeah, um, yes and no. I mean, it's the, the sails are almost too big that that you, you know, you have to use the winches and, and halyards and things to move them. So it's, 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 it's almost big enough where you've just got to be well drilled and well it is big enough that you've got to be well drilled to have good processes good lifting strops on bags good people you know who are well you know who are well practiced and and doing it well and yeah. um so that's that's basically what we spend all our time when we're practicing on comanche is is executing the maneuvers with as little downtime as possible once it's in point and shoot mode there's really only you know, four people doing anything. There's obviously the navigator deciding where you're going to go, the helmsman, the main sheet trimmer, and 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 someone trimming the often triple heading. You know, you just get one person to cover the whole lot. So, so you know, the reality is you need fast people fundamentally to make mm. it go as well as it goes, and you need to be going the right way, and then you need to have be well drilled so that when you're changing things um it's it's as slick as it can be we had an interesting one in the last hobart where you know we 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 wanted to do a sail change and it was right at dusk and and the helicopter came out the channel nine helicopter came out to to you know it was going to be that great beautiful sun going down shot yeah and you know he the pilot's right there with us and um you know, he couldn't have been much closer. And um, and so we had to basically do this whole change without any verbal communication because it was so loud. And it was a very, it was a, that was another moment, which I won't forget, you know, our practice, we had good guys, we were well drilled and um, and we just, you know, we, we snapped out a beautiful change um, with this helicopter thundering in the background. I, I mean, I didn't have this, but you made me about it when you, when it gets over thirty knots, angry. Tell me a bit about that. Well, you just, again, you've just you, you know that that they you you just it's just a management exercise. You know it um it's risk reward of of um how hard you're going to push um what the sea state will allow you to do um you know what the, the yeah it's just it's just a risk reward you know you've got to you've got to look after the people um you, know, you can't send anyone on the bow in full flight um uh because if you you know if you stuff it into the back of a wave they they you know they're going to hurt themselves yeah so um yeah it's you know it just definitely reminds you that it's a very big powerful boat and you certainly can't ever let 
you know, the tail start wagging the dog. Um, yeah, exactly. You've got to stay one step ahead of it. Um, and, and it, you know, that's a fine line because, you know, you've got some well-oiled machines out there. You know, Managing that power that you've got there. Yeah, and you know you've got to, you know, there's there's a reason why wild oats and blackjack and loyal and you know scallywag are hot on your heels. You know you've got you've got to do that. You got to do that well. Mm. Uh, I mean, and one of the one of the greatest images you get to see off that boat was the transpack. That was a t-shirt and shorts race if I've ever seen one. Every footage I saw, you guys were either in yeah. bloody yeah t-shirt and shorts. Sometimes I saw flower shirts on board. It looked yeah. very Hawaiian. That looked amazing. That was. Just a yeah, beam well, reach the whole way across. It looked fantastic. Yeah, that was, you know, that's that's beautiful Comanche conditions. There's no doubt about it, you know. And um, it, um, yeah, the, it's it's the perfect transpac boat. You, you, you know, one of the beauties with trans with with Comanche is, you know, it's you're 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 sailing at more than 20 degrees of heel, um, VMG running. So you you know you're nicely tipped over. It's a big wide boat. You're up here in the back corner, mm. so um, all hell's breaking loose down to leeward with white water, and you're you're up there in your shorts and t-shirt, as you say. <laughs> when, when when that goes bad, of course you are incredibly wet. Um, <laughs> but uh, but as long as it's all going as 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 planned, then then it's a pretty dry corner most of the time in that back corner. But uh, so no dream, dream ride. Ah, uh, beautiful. Uh, Comanche's recently been sold to a new owner and is now living life in the med. Uh, are you going to stay on board with the campaign? Is is it a, is it a changeover with you? Do you come with the boat? Yeah. Well, luckily I've been asked to come with it, and oh. um, you know that was an incredibly fortunate thing about the new owner's wishes was that you know as many of the guys um, that were involved uh, last time. Um, come and sail on the boat and and so that'll be very cool i mean incredibly bad timing for the new owner um you know he hasn't yet even seen the boat um mm. um so yeah we're just waiting to to put it together when we know um you know when when he's able to go sailing again and and when the world opens up but no, I mean, they've got some big plans for the boat and um, uh, the new owner's a very enthusiastic sailor and, and, and certainly loves the sport. Um, and so, you know, it's um, it's it's exciting that, the, you know, the Comanche's going on to a new a new adventure. So I'm guessing things like fast net and stuff like that. And yeah. Will all, come to the Hobart again? All early days, all, you know, all early days. Just got to just got to walk our way through it. And um, a bit like the cherub, got to make sure that you know we get got the enjoyment uh, element of it right, and that um, you know that we're doing the right events for the right reasons and things. So um, it'll start off quite day sailing orientated, um, go and do some cool regattas, um, and then and then slowly grow into the direction he wants to take it. But again, wonderful platform. Well, my, my last question on Comanche is, is basically how do I get a ride and my hands up if you need yeah. another crew member? I know TJ and Kyle, so I've got some ins. So there and you go. now yourself, so beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, look, I'll just finish off the interview. Uh, let's finish off with the boat behind me, the next America's yeah. Cup. What do you think of the boats? And as you can see in the photo, you've been up very close. What's What are they like? Uh, I mean, you know, that. I've got to take my hat off to them. Anyone that can write a rule, write a protocol, um, announce an America's Cup in a concept of sailing which the world had never seen, I think is a very, you know, it's an amazing achievement just in itself. And, you know, no no, no naval architect or article that I saw came out and, and said it wasn't going to work. Um <laughs> You know, it's 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 just unbelievable, really. Um, yeah, it's you know, it's 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 a different form of yachting, um, but you know, foils are foils are here to stay. Um, you know, and and we're going to see it in 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 every aspect of the sport going forward. Mm. Um, yeah, so you know, this this is going to push 
but like with the sales, it's going to push that technology. And, you know, the, at the end of this cup cycle, there's going to be thousands of people that know a thousand times more about foils and sailing that didn't, you know, that didn't know it before. So no, it's a, it's a very cool thing. And I mean, and where do you see the sailing heading in the future? I mean, the little boat, the test boat was an anor- amazing bit of, bit of kit. And I, I mean, personally, I can see that getting put into the mainstream of keelboating. I wouldn't be surprised if some of those start turning up. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be interesting. I mean, there's some cool platforms out there, the 69F and the, and some little, you know, there's lots of foiling ventures going on. Obviously, the the, the, the Youth America's Cup boat, which the squadron launched, um, and, then, and then there's all the, you know, the American Magic had the mule and, Team New Zealand's um, little boat. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, they, they are still little Formula One cars or big Formula One cars. The complexity um, is still, you know, extensive and, and you know, and they're incredibly complicated pieces of kit. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know, uh, I mean, how the trickle down would be, will be. I've got no idea, to be honest. Um, you know, when plasma TVs first came out, they were 30 grand and now they're 300 bucks. So I don't know whether this world of an unbelievably controlled, you know, systems controlling these foiling boats in 10 years time will be able to be done, you know, on a purchase, um, because we will just be so much more advanced in our understanding of the foils, et cetera, um, that, that it will just become normal. I mean, you've got to think, I mean, even just watching these guys tow down the harbour, you know, at 30 knots, um, I mean, all the cup teams tow the boats at 30 knots because it's safer. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, where where is that going to end? I mean, why wouldn't you have your power boat up out of the water like, like this, et cetera? So, I mean, I know the ferries used to do it years you know, where clearly it's a very efficient way of moving across water. So mm. you've got to think it's only going to grow from here. Exactly. So, look, I'll end it on my usual last question uh, <laughs> that I've asked everyone. Looking back, what advice would you give to a young Mike Sanderson or a young sailor today out there? Uh, what would you say to them? Um, I think, you know, still, we're still incredibly fortunate with sailing that, that, you know, we, it's, it can be anything from your weekend hobby or passion or once or twice a year hobby or passion. I mean, I go skiing seven or eight days a year, 10 days a year if I'm lucky, and lots of people go sailing seven or eight days, 10 days a year if they're lucky, Um, all the way through to being Peter Burling or Nathan Outeridge or, or Ben Ainsley. So there's just this huge range of mm. people enjoying what what we love. And what I would say to a young to a young myself is, you know, um, I think there's still many many ways of achieving, you know, your dream in in our sport. Um, I still believe that it's very possible through through the trade. Um, I think still there's a huge demand for sail makers and riggers and boat builders. And, you know, you you know, the, the trade is still very strong and the trade still gives you opportunities um, to, to explore the world on a super yacht or join an America's Cup team or still be an America's Cup sailor. Um, if you really want to be, certainly be an ocean race sailor, certainly be an Amoka sailor, um, you know, certainly be a super yacht, you know, sailor or mate or captain or, or whatever you wish. So, I mean, I, you know, and the beauty is, you know, you can keep you can keep doing it for as long as as you want to. You, you know, you've just got to look at some of the most famous people in our sport, you, you know, um, are doing it well into their you know, 50s and 60s and things. Well, it's just unheard of in any in most other sports. So, you know, we're incredibly lucky. So now choose your road, work hard, um, 
don't don't rest back when you when you get your opportunity don't don't uh don't take your foot off the throttle i think that's mm. probably the one of the big things i see people get an opportunity to come and join us with Bellamante or get the opportunity to get involved in Team New Zealand or or whatever it might be and they think they've made it and so that they just start going with the flow and being like everyone else that's been there forever. Your chance, if you do get a chance, is to put your head down and work harder than everyone else. And um, I think if you spoke to everyone who who has achieved their, their dreams in our sport, I think you'd find that's probably what they the one thing that they had in common is is they just worked hard and um, yeah. it's no there's no secret i don't think <laughs> well look that's fantastic advice i love that you've come on board and had a had a chat to us today i really appreciate it and uh enjoy the next week of uh of yeah lockdown. one more week of lockdown yeah yeah i'm i'm i'm, I'm busy writing uh down i i <laughs> I have to confess that my evenings are spent um, coming up with new deck layouts um, for the, for the, for the new chair, which I am going to do. So uh, yeah, I, I know your Ronstan catalogue better than most at the moment. So uh, that's your fault. <laughs> ah, very good. Thanks, Mike. Cool. Cheers. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you for the opportunity, and um, look forward to catching up soon. Ah, good, good. Thanks, mate. <laughs>